my name is Darla Shaw. I'm a volunteer at the Ridgefield Historical Society, and we're going to be interviewing interesting people about growing up in Ridgefield. This is such a fascinating town with people with great stories to tell. And today we're going to be meeting with Barbara Sarah Filippi, who most people probably knew as the town clerk, but we're going to go way back into her background, all the way back to Italy. Welcome, Barbara. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you for having me. Well, if you could start way back with your family in Italy and how they landed up in Richfield, Connecticut. Okay, I'll do that. Well, um, my I am second generation American. Um, my grandparents came from Italy, but my parents were born here in, in Ridgefield, uh, well, North Salem and Ridgefield. Um, my grandfather, Antonio, came from the region in Italy called the Marche, and that is on the central eastern side of Italy, about halfway down, bordered on the west by the uh, Aryan Mountains and on the right by the Adriatic Sea. Uh, I do have a map and I don't know if that you can see it. I've circled the area and all the people that come from the, this region, the Marke region, are called Marcajanis and that's the dialect that is spoken there. My grandfather left a small town in Italy called San Lorenzo when he was 20 years old, he left his father behind and his family, and he ventured here to America. And um, I think it was for, he wanted a better opportunity. During that time, in the early 1900s, um, Italy was going through a famine and uh, poverty. So the young men, wanted to come to America because they had heard so much about it. I don't know if they were recruited to come here to work. Uh, that's the story that some people tell me, but I think that they just wanted to come over. They had heard from relatives that it was a much better opportunity. So my grandfather came over and he came to uh, North Salem, New York to work in the Port of Missing Men. Now the Port of Missing Men was developed by a New York attorney, Mr. H.B. Anderson, and he had bought about 1,700 acres, most of it in New York, in North Salem, and a little bit of it in Ridgefield, in Connecticut. And what he did was uh, he brought over the immigrants and uh, they worked on clearing the road, because he wanted to make an exclusive housing development there. So all these immigrants wanted to work, they came over, they cleared the woods, the trees, they made roads. Um, my grandfather, as a matter of fact, was a teamster. He drove the horse and wagons where they loaded the wood from the trees they had cut down, and he transported them here to Ridgefield to the uh, railroad station, and then it went further on for, for different things. Now, these immigrants, over a hundred of them, my father used to tell me, uh, lived in what they called shanties. And they were just wooden structures with tar paper roofs, no electricity, no running water. They maybe live five or six to a room. It was very primitive. As a matter of fact, my oldest aunt was born there in the shanties, in one of them. Um, and it, it wasn't a great place, but they were grateful that they had a roof over their heads and they made the most of it and they worked very hard. They worked from sunup to sundown. Now, it was all men that came over. There yes. were no women or no. children no. in this group. And as you said, they mostly worked as contractors and excavators and so on. Yeah, they did manual work. Right. 
Uh, and what's interesting, you talked about clearing the land for these various housings mm -hmm. to be set later on, and I live on one. Yes, you do. And I never realized uh, that until I heard your story. Um, how did they deal with not knowing English? Well, that wasn't easy. Um, I have read somewhere, I think in Aldo um, Biagiotti's book, Impact, that some people in Ridgefield gave lessons in English at the town hall to some of them. Uh, others, they just picked it up. They, they, you know, they worked. The, uh, a lot of the people in town were of Irish descent, and they picked up a lot from, from them as well. Um, they built 17 miles of roads up at the Port of Missing Men. Um, they, it was interesting that a lot of them stayed and after they worked up there, they moved into Ridgefield and they brought their wives over from Italy. Oh. Now some of them went back to Italy, got married and came over. Others, like my grandparents, my grandfather took my grandmother, they didn't take my grandmother, she came over and, uh, he picked her up down at Ellis Island, and they were married in a, a, a chapel just for immigrants down in New York City. Oh, how fascinating. Yeah. Um, did many of them meet women here, any of the Irish women, and marry them, or did they no, usually go back to Italy? They, yeah. Um, that happened, like, during World War II. Okay. A lot of the Italian young men married Irish women, and vice versa. It was uh, was a nice mixture, right? Very nice mixture. Now you said that your family moved into town, so yes. then you moved um, uh, near the center of town. No, and... no. We we in North Salem lived on Hump Mountain, oh. and we moved maybe half a mile over the line, the New York state line, on North Salem Road. Oh, okay. Past the high school. Right. Where the present high school is now. Right. Maybe a half a mile from there. And my father started his own business, his own contracting business there. And uh, I was really so happy. I was only six years old when we moved into Ridgefield because it was a whole different world. I had to go to school in Croton Falls when I was in North Oh my State. goodness, that's yeah, a drive. That was a good half an hour bus ride. Right. And when I moved into Ridgefield, it, there was a whole different feeling. It was a community. And we had a main street. You could go shopping. It was wonderful. In North Salem, we were isolated. We're yeah. Up on a mountain. We still are. Yeah. Yes, and it still yeah. is that way. Well, yeah, yeah. And it still is that way. So I was just thrilled to come, come to Richfield and start school. Now, um, did the Italian American Club start around that time? No, about 1926. I think I looked it up. That's when they built it. And my grandfather, both my grandfathers, my grandfather Torsellini and my grandfather Fula, both were very instrumental in building that. That was all volunteers. They built that on their own. Wow. And that was a mutual aid society, which kind of was the uh, uh, beginning of like an insurance policy that if someone got sick and they couldn't work, they would pay them for a certain amount of time. And they also had a death benefit yes. that if you died, uh, you got a certain amount of money. Of course, you pay dues every month. Right. But they were reasonable. They were very minimal. Right. Uh, but that was the great gathering place for all the Italian Oh, Americans. I remember that. I, I miss it. Everybody misses it. And we certainly who lives do. in town. Right. Tell me, um, you know, about your, your schooling. You said yes. you came here at six. It was a different existence here. Do you remember your teachers, I, the name yes, of the I, school or whatever? Well, we just called it. That was our school, Richfield School. Now, oh. today everybody calls it the old high school. Well, it really wasn't. It was from, we went from first grade until 12th grade, all in one school. Mm -hmm. Each class 
uh, or I should say every grade level had two teachers. Um, we had a, uh, a gym teacher, uh, Margaret O'Sullivan, and then uh, a little later on, uh, Bill Allen came in uh, for the boys and coaching the football team and basketball. Um, the teachers back then, most of them were women, single women. We even had two sets of sisters who taught, the Bolin sisters oh, yeah. and the Reagan sisters. And most of them were females. Uh, I think in fourth grade, I had Mr. Caponero. He was our first male teacher in the elementary school. As we uh, got into junior high and high school, then we began to see more men. We had Dr. Scandera, we had Mr. Bolenbach, we had Paul Faco, uh, Mr. Singer. Uh, then we had a lot of, uh, more men came into the teaching profession as I got into like seventh, eighth grade and the high school. Wow, you have such a memory that you can go back to elementary school Yes. And remember these people. Now, did you um, maintain the Italian language? Did your yes. parents speak yes. it? Or how about the this kids? This is what's school? absolutely amazing is that um, uh, my, my grandparents lived with us when we moved into Richfield, and they only spoke Italian. My grandfather had a kind of a broken English. He couldn't. My grandmother lived here for 60 some years, never spoke a word of English. So somehow I learned Italian so I could speak to them. Just came naturally because yeah. I heard them speaking it. I didn't have to take any lessons or whatever. And um, But my father and his two sisters who were brought up with Italian parents who only spoke Italian at home went to schools over in North Salem, and they spoke beautiful English, beautiful handwriting. I don't know how they did it. I give them a lot of credit, because yeah. they came from people who just didn't know anything about it, about the English language or, or anything of that nature, but they learned, and they did. Yeah, uh, I'm so amazed when I look at the people with the Italian backgrounds, how quickly they rose to important positions yes. in town yes. in so few generations. Yes. And you said they were so dedicated and bright and just did what they had yeah. to. They knew hard work. Okay. And they knew what they left. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they knew what they were looking for. And to this day, I thank them because, uh, you know, they, there was a lot of poverty in Italy. And there was a famine going on at the time when my grandfather came out. I, I looked, did a little uh, research, and between 1900 and 1915, three million Italians immigrated to the United States. Wow. That's a lot of people. Yeah. And they settled all over. You know, then New yeah. York City, uh, Bridgeport, uh, you know, New so Haven. Do you uh, still have relatives in Italy? Uh, not immediate, probably cousin. Okay. Uh, my fa my grandfather's right. uh, cousins. Yeah. No, I don't have any 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 buddy there. So you told me all about these teachers you yes. had and how you had more and more male teachers. Mm -hmm. So um, you graduated from Richville High School. Yep, nineteen sixty. Right. And uh, tell had, us a little bit about your graduation or special events or yes. sports. Well, <coughs> we were 60 in my class. We graduated 60. And um, our, our activities were, um, well, what I, what I, I love sports, so I did play uh, uh, base, uh, softball and basketball with Miss O'Sullivan who was our gym teacher. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, as an extracurricular uh, uh, sporting thing, Bob Tulipani, who just passed away recently, who was just a wonderful man and teacher, he started a CYO, Catholic Youth Organization, uh, 
girls basketball and oh, girls wow. softball league. And he was our coach. And we just, that's how we spent the winters with basketball and the summer with, with the softball. Yeah. Um, I also, uh, we had a thespian society, which one of our teachers, Lucille Spicer, um, uh, directed. And uh, we put on productions, which were very good. And I liked working on the stage and up on the spotlights. I didn't participate in acting at all. Um, what else? What other acted? We had uh, 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 Hilltop Dispatch, was our our monthly little newspaper oh, that we okay. worked on. We had an opera guild wow. with one of the Miss Bolins. Yeah. And she took us once a year down to the Met, and we'd see different operas, and that was great. Right. Uh, now, uh, after high school, yeah. uh, what did you do? Well, after high school, I went to college. I okay. went to the university. Was that usual at that time for women? No, it was not. I didn't think so, right. There were many opportunities for women back then. You either became a nurse, yeah. a teacher, or a secretary. And so um, I opted to go to the University of Bridgeport and uh, I studied what they called back then secretarial science. And I graduated from there in 1962. Now, did you get married while you were in no. school or no. after you after. graduated? So after. you had a career, what did you do I for after in, you graduated? After I graduated, I went back to work at Allen's Men's Store. Oh my goodness, Allen's. Where yeah. I had worked after school, since I was 16 years old, and on weekends, and then I went back there, and I worked there. Uh, I loved retailing, and I liked, uh, and I did some of the bookkeeping for them. Yeah. And, uh, for those people who don't know, I think there's a ballet studio yes. there now, but yes. that will always, be to Alan's. all of us old-timers, be Alan's yeah. store. They were wonderful people to work for. They taught me a lot about working, and um, you know, it, it was a great place to work. Yeah, uh, it was all family-owned businesses yes. at that time, and you highly respected and knew the family exactly. so well. Exactly, yeah. and they were good because they respected the people that came in their store, and right. I learned a lot from them. Yeah, I really did. Okay, so how um, did you start your whole family? Yes, well, um, I, how did you meet your husband? I met my husband, Richard, at a function at the Italian American oh, Club. Oh, yeah. Naturally, right? Yeah. He was maybe four years ahead of me in high school. I didn't really know him then. And uh, he had gone into the Marine Corps. And then when he came out, there was a function at the Italian American Club that we met. And uh, two years later, we were married. And we started our family. And I had two boys, Andrew and Mark, and um, that was it. Uh, Richard was involved a lot in ritual community. He was a constable for over 20 years. He was president of the Marine Corps League. He was president of the Little League. Um, he was very involved in, in the community. He was also on the Conservation Commission, which he liked very much. and. Uh, and that was it. Well, I know the name Sarah Filippi was very important, and uh, I didn't realize how many organizations he had belonged yes, to. Yes, he did. Now, how did you go from Allen's and accounting to town clerk? Okay. So, when my youngest son, I was a stay-at-home mom, and when my youngest son was about 10 years old, um, I was shopping one day at the old A&P, which is now Walgreens. Uh, I met Ann Buccetti, who was the probate secretary for Judge Romeo Petroni. Okay. She came up to me, she was shopping, and she said, you know, she said, we have uh, town hall, uh, uh, the town clerk at the time, Terry Leary, is taking a three months leave of absence, so they need somebody to fill in in the office. She said, by any chance, would you be interested? And I said, well, I don't know. Went home, discussed it with my husband, and he said, yeah, it was the winter months. He said, go ahead. He said, go ahead, I'll, you know, be home 
in the afternoon for the boys, whatever. And I said, okay. So I did. Well, those three months, <laughs> she, she did not come back. She opted to, to not come back. And so they offered me the job. And so I took it. Those three months turned into 39 years. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Very productive years. Yeah. So do you remember the highlights of your 39 years? Things that changed or were oh, different or yeah, important? Yeah. You know, I, I kind of jotted down a couple of things. Um, because that's an important position yes. in uh, town, and you're really privy to so much that goes on. You are. Um, I don't think that most people know what the town clerk does. So I just briefly will tell you that uh, the town clerk is, is considered the keeper of the records. She's re she or he are responsible for all the land records that come in transfers, mortgages, releases, liens that go against people. They have to maintain those records. It's set by the state, by the state library, how you maintain them, what kind of paper you put them on, what kind of ink you use, whatever. Um, she's also uh, in charge of elections, determining who's running for office, uh, the terms. She has to keep records of everyone their terms and uh, uh, when their terms expire. Um, also, vital statistics. She's in charge of all the births, marriages, and deaths that occur in Ridgefield or to people who live in Ridgefield. She's got to maintain all the minutes of all the boards and commissions. Uh, yeah, uh, swearing in officials, uh, giving out marriage licenses, uh, dog licenses, liquor permits. I, I could go on and on. It's a, it's a very job, many different duties. You have to office. be extremely well organized, I would think, to be yes. able to handle this. Yes, it was, um, it, it was great. I don't think I could have ever had a better job in my life. Uh, it was just a, a wonderful experience. I always had a good staff behind me, and I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. The thing is that um, we ha I had many bosses. You, actually, everybody thinks that maybe the Board of Selectmen is the boss, of, no, but it's not. The state of Connecticut, the Secretary of State's office was my boss. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, yet. yeah. Secretary of State, Department of Health. Department of Agriculture, we had to follow all the laws uh, that set by them and the Elections Commission. So you almost had a legal background as well? Then. Yes, yeah. you had to keep up. Um, right. I, I attended, I became a certified town clerk. I went to many, many courses. And um, yes, you have to have a, you know a little bit about uh, the legality of it all too. You have to be very careful, very careful. Uh, my favorite part of my job was when I would go and swear in the new police officers or oh. the new firemen. Oh, yeah, that that's just, special. Yeah. That was special to me because these young men protected us and uh, it was just, that was my, my very favorite part of the job was doing that. Uh, least favorite, maybe elections. Very Ooh. difficult. Yeah. Very yeah. difficult. Very difficult. So many laws that are involved in how you set up the ballot, issuing absentee ballots, you know, keeping track of who's up for election, who's not, uh, you know, all the boards and commissions. That that was my least favorite. But, um, but you had such an overview of the town, what yes. was going on, why it was happening, how it might improve. Uh, you had your, you know, fingertips on everything, which I think yes. is so important yes. in a job like that. And yes. as you said, um, your grandparents came over yeah. during poverty, during uh, poverty, trying to survive, and here you are, a pivotal person in the government, you yes. know, after two generations. Yeah. And I think that's so commendable. Right. Well, my grandparents and parents... 
you know, taught us good things. Right. Uh, how to, you know, how to work, how to respect people, and uh, it meant a lot to them. And you're still working, helping, and supporting people. How are you doing it now after your 39 years in retirement? Yes. Well, I am enjoying my retirement. <clears throat> I do volunteer. I volunteer at the Scott House, which I love doing the history. And believe me, I have to say that I thought I had a lot of old records in town hall that I was very proud of. <laughs> because we go back to 1709, okay. the, the land records in town hall. And uh, I thought I had a lot, and I thought, wow, you know. When I went to the Scott House to volunteer, and I saw all the historical records that they have. It just blew my mind. Wow. They do a wonderful job. They really do, and I enjoy being there and volunteering. I also volunteer at St. Mary's a day a week. Uh, and um, the, the best, uh, and at the uh, RVNA, I go in when they need help. Uh, you know, uh, right, right. with their mailings and whatever. Yeah. Nothing on the medical side of it. Uh, and of course, my very favorite thing is I play cards every Wednesday with my old friends oh that my. I went to school with 65 years ago. Oh my goodness. And that's because you've lived in Richfield or North Salem your yes. whole life and you've yes. maintained these friendships. Well, I, I think that's fascinating. It is. And we just, we love it. There's five of us. We went to school together and we're here. We are 80 years old and we're still still together. Uh, Sandy Periandri, Lynn Cassegrain, Don Balzarini, uh, Aileen Negan, and Pat Likas, and myself. And, and they all have Italian stuff. backgrounds, They right? do. Okay. So we have a lot to share. Um, uh, you know, uh, I know in your outline you asked me to talk about my grandparents, about cooking, about their gardening. Oh, and that's I, right. Let's talk I, about, we'll end then yes, with the cooking, the gardening, yes, and the skills. Tell and, about and that. I will, because that was so important to me. Uh, my grandfather, Torcellini, he was a wonderful vegetable garden. And when we lived up on North Salem Road, we had a garden, maybe a half an acre large. Grew everything from tomatoes, string beans, everything you can imagine, uh, Darla. And then my mother and grandmother would, of course, you know, preserve them for the winter, the tomatoes um, and many of the other vegetables. My grandfather Frula, Enrico Frula, he was a f wonderful flower gardener. He could plant any flower that you, that you wanted and uh, he was very good at, at gardening and flowering. My grandmothers were great cooks. There were no recipes when you asked them, nonni, which we called our grandmothers in Italian. That's the name for grandma. Uh, nonni, how do you make this? Oh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. There were no cookbooks. They didn't know what a cookbook was. It was all up here. They knew how to do it. My grandmother, Torcellini, Amelia, she was a great pasta maker. Oh, she could make any kind of pasta you wanted. And she was also... She worked as a tailor when she was in Italy, so she was a great uh, seamstress. So, no, uh, I, I wonderful, think, uh, yeah. wonderful people. No, I remember when you talked about your friends you play cards yes. with and how they survived during the Depression, and they said we didn't have a problem. Didn't have a problem. We we could. We had animals. We had vegetables exactly. and fruits. We knew how to do everything by ourselves. You were such an amazingly resourceful people, oh, yes. and yes. I I think Ridgefield is just so. You know, we are. It's such a valuable commodity we had in having the Italians come here when they did and just changed yes. the face of the Absolutely. sound. They um, really did. They yeah. really did. Yeah. yeah. I'm just um, and and growing up, I want just one thing to say is that we didn't care who anybody was or their background. We were just friends, and uh, that's that's the way it's remained. Yeah. Throughout. Right. My, my whole life here in Richmond. 
We were just friends. I love that, and we're going to end with that. We Very were funny. just friends. We maintained, and we continue. And I want to thank you so much, Barbara, for your insights. They oh, were you're so welcome. rich and so full, and people need to hear these stories of resilience, starting yes. from nothing. From nothing. And really creating an amazing life. They, they have. I'm so grateful to my grandparents right. for coming here to, to America. And you know one other thing? They never wanted to go back to Italy. <laughs> no. Maybe to visit. But that no, was, not even that. Not, not no, even to visit. Oh, that's to go so back. surprising. They just loved it here. Okay. And that was their... Yeah, they made their home. So I'm yeah. proud of them. Yeah, they had what a, a legacy. Of, they had a lot of courage. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. And, and that's it for our much. first program. I hope you've enjoyed and learned a lot about the Italians, about the town clerk, the community, the friendship, and the value of what goes yes. on here. Yes.